Hi, and thanks for joining me. This is the show where regular people like yourself get to share real experiences and insights about pain and life. In these casual conversations, we're usually talking about a type of pain that strikes from out of the clear blue, while we're just living life, often doing everyday things that we've done what seems like a million times before. But for some reason, one day, the body suddenly decides it's just had enough. So is this pain the beginning of the end? Is it a sign of a more serious defect? Are you gonna have pain for the rest of your life now? What do you do when this happens to you? Do you reach for over-the-counter pain meds, ice, or heat? Do you turn to your medical doctor or chiropractor? What about acupuncture, PT, massage? Are you someone who gets irritated by the intrusion of pain? Or does pain scare you and stress you out? Maybe you're someone who just ignores it and have been able to laugh it off for most of your life. I'm your host, Yaling Liu, and these are just some of the questions I talk about with my guests. In this podcast series, we explore everyday aches and pains from the perspective of people just like you. I'm a chiropractor, and some of these guests are my patients. I've been working with bodies in pain since 1994, and one of my favorite parts of practice is still the time I get to spend connecting with people about life as it relates to their pain. It's what continues to give me a much deeper and richer understanding. Some of the most significant breakthroughs that I see in practice happen through conversation. It's during these frank discussions that we often stumble upon realizations that can help us move forward. This is exactly why I want to share them with you here. It may not always feel like it, but I'm here to tell you that there is, in fact, always a solution. As long as you're working with a living, breathing body and brain, there will always be potential for change and improvement, just sometimes not in the way we might have been expecting. In today's episode, I find myself wanting to ask the question, is your stress level stressing you out? We hear a lot in the news and on TV about stress and disease, its effects on heart health and longevity and all the rest of it. Your sleep affects stress levels, or is it the stress that affects your sleep? There's good stress and there's bad stress. How do you even know which kind of stress you're having? It can be a pretty fine line. In my work with patients, the topic of stress comes up a lot. Pain is a very clear signal that there is some form of stress at play, and part of treating pain successfully from a holistic perspective usually involves asking ourselves, what the heck is stressing my body? It can be something you're doing with your movements or positioning. It can be something you're eating, drinking, or breathing that is incompatible with your body chemistry. More commonly, I think when most of us think of stress, we're thinking of emotional stress. Usually pain is a frustrating combination of all three, mechanical, chemical, and emotional. In this episode, the topic of stress happens to center around a work scenario for my guest. But if you listen all the way through, you'll notice towards the end of our conversation, how this work stress manifested in multifaceted ways. And it wasn't until she transformed her situation that she gained better perspective on exactly how broadly she was being affected by it. So, so I guess background is that I had been a teacher for a long time and then transitioned into a principal role. And I think when I, I don't know how long we had known each other when I really started having that low back or if it I came like to you with it pretty no I don't think so I don't think so either no but I felt like the transition between teaching in the classroom where you're up and walking around and squatting to talk to a kiddo and up again and downstairs mm -hmm. to get them from the recess and upstairs again I had a lot of movement built in as a teaching position and then when I switched to a principal position it's way more stationary mm -hmm. which I didn't even as I'm you know, moving along in a career path, I'm not, I wasn't even thinking about like the physical changes that would, might be happening. So I spent a ton more time sitting and I found that even if I was getting out to classrooms and to the lunchroom and things like that, oftentimes I would go and then sit. If I walk around a classroom as a principal, I kind of throw everything off off kilter. The kids are like, oh, it's the president. <laughs> you know? So the teachers don't always appreciate that when they're trying to accomplish something. So it would be like, walk, walk, walk to a classroom, sit, walk to the next classroom, sit. And so I was like trying to move more, but that wasn't happening. And so I think the lead in was just a transition to not as much 
daily movement. And then when I would have a kiddo, which has happened a number of times, but in particular, this little first grade friend that liked to melt and then she just <laughs> needed a safe place to let it out would Aww. get escorted down to my office. So sometimes that would mean, you know, bending over. What Jen is referring to here when she says melting is a pretty good descriptor, actually, for what happens when kids are having a meltdown. <laughs> This poor young one was a repeat offender, which is part of what made it an issue for Jen's back. The little one would have a meltdown and in doing so, turn herself into a protesting and impressive sandbag of sorts. Parents who've experienced the tantrum phenomenon probably know that kids just suddenly have a knack for becoming total dead weight and then some if they're struggling. Each time this happened, the procedure in Jen's scenario was to physically remove her from the classroom and carry her to the office where they would sit together and wait out the tantrum. In addition to carrying her, Jen would also then sit on the floor in her office with her back against the door to keep the students safe as the tantrum took its course, but this would mean physically straining for quite some time in an awkward position to keep the door closed behind herself while facing this poor girl's angry efforts to escape. I do love how Jen refers to the little first grader as her friend and just generally talks about her and these episodes with kindness and humor, which demonstrates that it's not as though there was a lot of emotional strain for Jen dealing with this student, but she certainly was dealing with her share of mechanical challenges. The lifting, carrying, and holding the door closed was all happening while focusing on getting through the situation, so naturally the impact to her back wasn't felt until it was all over. This is why it wasn't immediately obvious to Jen until we had a few probing conversations during her treatments. Well, I don't think I even realized that that kiddo episode was even triggering anything. I would just come to you and be like, oh, my low back. Mm -hmm. And so you ask enough questions like, what have you been doing differently or whatever, you know, how's work been? Have you been playing tennis and stuff like that? And then I'm like, oh, I have this crazy little first grader, right? (laughs) And then you sort of connect the dots, I think, from that outside perspective of, okay, so that's probably causing some problem here (laughs) that I'm just thinking about what am I going to do with this kiddo Monday, you know, kind of thing. So I think you helped me even with the self-awareness piece. So then the next time somebody melts like that, at least I'm thinking about like how long I'm there and what I'm doing and what I might want to do afterward. And so sometimes you're putting that piece in place too. like, okay, so when this happens again, you might want to go walk around the building a few times. I don't remember what we talked about, but you always have constructive things that are usually pretty simple. I mean, I did see a massage therapist with some regularity. So I think the combination of those two things was helpful. That massage therapist definitely had an element of discussion too. So I think she probably had some awareness of what was going on. I don't feel like it's as extensive as when I'm working with you, you're sort of talking to me during I'm not letting you rest. Our work. <laughs> you always let me rest. Eventually. You always yeah. Yeah, walk away for a while and then I try not to fall asleep. But yeah. That's I, all good feedback. That's all really important stuff. So it yeah. sounds like you're saying that there is some significant value for you to the conversation piece and the awareness piece. Yes. Because that subconsciously changes what you do. Yes. Cool. Or even consciously, if you oh, give yeah. me some think about this, try that kind of stuff that I'm like, okay, okay, we just had a meltdown. Kiddo's fine. You know, everything is restored. What was it that Yangling was telling me that I should do? And then, you know, like, okay, I'm just going to table stretch or I think about or I don't know, walk around or something like that. Yeah. How great is it that in this first episode, my guest Jen unprompted perfectly illustrates the benefit to the conversation piece in practice. In the current healthcare environment where reimbursement models result in shorter and shorter patient visits, it seems like a luxury to have time for conversation between patients and healthcare providers. But so many times conversation is essential to uncovering unexpected details that lead to solutions. Okay, now this bit about stretching. You may barely have picked up on it because she mentions it just very quickly. Something about a table stretch as an example of something I might suggest. Just the mention of the word stretch gets my attention because of how controversial the topic can be. 
I don't think Jen was referring to a specific instruction from me, and it's possible that something I showed her may have felt like a stretch to her, but because everyone's idea of stretching is different, I'll just say a few words about it now, and you'll definitely hear the topic come up again in future episodes. Okay, the one thing I will say briefly about my beef with the stretching do's and don'ts is that the popular notion out in the world seems to be that stretching is a good idea in response to pain and sensations of tightness. I'm just going to ask you to give some thought to what I'm about to say. If you have been stretching something that feels tight or an area that hurts in the hopes of making that go away, it probably feels good to do that, doesn't it? The stretch makes the pain lessen in the moment and even probably for a little while after that too. But looking at the big picture, do you get the feeling that you're just not stretching often enough or you're not doing it right somehow because this part of your body always feels tight? If something that you're stretching continues to feel tight day in and day out to varying degrees, even if only intermittently throughout the day, could it be that stretching is maybe not the answer? Now, stretching after warming up your muscles with activity is a wonderful time to stretch. This is when it can be very complimentary and safe. Active stretching is very safe. This is when you work your muscles in order to accomplish a stretch. Rather than just forcing something, some positioning, and trying to relax into it, hoping for elongation. The reason why yoga works, among many other reasons it works, but one is that the stretching that happens in many yoga poses requires other muscles to do the work of creating that stretch. It's when people strive for the stretch and neglect the muscular activation piece and the strength piece, that's when injuries happen. If I give a patient an exercise that feels like a stretch, it's usually happening with some sort of simultaneous muscle activation because that is the safest way to get results. As a younger practitioner, I wasn't as careful to teach my patients this and it's something that I now know is essential. Okay, now that I've gotten that off my chest. Do you have thoughts about stretching? Have you had the experience of stretching something and never really feeling long-term relief? I am very interested to hear your thoughts on it. And at the end of the podcast, you'll hear some links where you can engage with me and potentially with some other listeners about what you hear in these episodes. I don't know. I feel like sometimes pain can be like an itch that really needs to be scratched, but you can't scratch it. That's when I get to the point where I'm like, I'm going to take some Advil because like it's distracting me. Yeah, so sometimes I would get to that point, but also try not to because I feel like when you dole that, sometimes you keep exacerbating the same thing because you don't realize that yeah. there's an issue there, so you're not very protective of it. I'm sure many of you know NSAIDs is an acronym, an abbreviation for non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. She mentions Advil, which is a brand name for ibuprofen. There's also naproxen sodium, Aleve, and acetaminophen, Tylenol. And Jen's absolutely right to be careful by trying not to use them too often. There is real benefit to turning off the pain signal before your nervous system adapts, and which it does so well. But when it adapts, it learns to tune it out to the point where eventually it'll take a five alarm fire for you to notice that something's not working for your body. But as Jen points out, when the pain signal has been eliminated, it's easy to push yourself past that warning sign that your body was trying to give you. I do not prescribe pharmaceutical medication, and so it's not my job to tell you what to do in regards to which you should take and which you should not take, but I think no matter how you decide to use these over-the-counter pain meds, you should simply do so with awareness. The awareness that you are simply turning off your pain, (sighs) buying yourself some time and sanity so that you can work on doing something about the underlying reason for the pain. If you're just turning off the pain, hoping that it will magically never happen again, you may be very lucky, and you may also be sorely disappointed. These medications do not solve problems, but they do offer relief. You also should have awareness of what some other unintended effects can be. And they are widely available, these medications, because someone decided that they are relatively safe. Relative to what, I'm not sure, but they will generally not kill you in one dose. Most NSAIDs, however, do impact your body in ways that you cannot easily measure in real time. As with many medicines and even herbs, it's the organs of elimination that have to deal with processing these chemical components. 
For that reason, there can be some low-grade impact to the liver and the kidneys by these NSAIDs. There's also evidence that there is some elevated chance of experiencing intestinal stress for some, bleeding, for example. There have been recent studies that link regular NSAID use to higher rates of cardiovascular problems as well. And all of these effects will vary depending on where you are with your physical condition. And sometimes that's hard to know until we've crossed the line somewhere. Kind of like with pain, we don't develop symptoms until whatever was going on behind the scenes reaches a tipping point. Lastly, there is mixed information in the research out there that suggests a possibility that these over-the-counter anti-inflammatory medications might actually disturb or slow down tissue healing and repair. This makes some sense since inflammation is the first line of defense in response to injury. It's how the body initiates the early repair effort. It's only when the inflammation process gets out of control or goes on for too long that it becomes a problem for us. For this reason, short-term NSAID use is said to not affect healing time, but it's worth knowing about this connection between NSAIDs and our natural tissue repair mechanisms because we might be trading tissue healing to some small degree in exchange for pain relief. So as you know, I've switched jobs. Mm -hmm. So done principling, moving into real estate, having a fun time doing that, having, I have a ton more flexibility in my schedule. Nice. So I'm not at a desk all the time, maybe for a little stretch while I'm working on something that's computer driven for somebody, writing up an offer or doing a search for them or something like that. But it's not nearly as long of a stretch as when I used to go from meeting to meeting to meeting and I'm in the same chair and the people on the other side of the table are rotating. Mm -hmm. And I can get more movement in, so I don't feel like I have that setup of being stationary, seated for so long. So I think that helps a ton. This morning, for some reason, it registered that we talked a lot about playing tennis because that was kind of a weekly thing I was doing while in between our visits. And I feel like since I've switched jobs, I don't get nearly as tired in a tennis lesson. Huh. Like I used to have to like be like, oh my God, I'm going to die. <laughs> and then my lungs are on fire. <laughs> Someone scoop me up if I, if I pass out on the court. <laughs> and I would like, seriously, everyone would come together to like discuss stuff and I would sit and oh. just be like, <gasps> <gasps> or yeah. I would sit out of something and be like, I really need a break. Hmm. And I hadn't been taking participating in tennis lessons for a little while just because there wasn't a class that fit. But in the last couple of weeks, I played somewhere and I'm like, oh, I'm going to be dying because I haven't played and I haven't found that. That's cool. So I won. That has made me, you know, like, hmm, because I would have thought that without the continued playing that I would have issues with being so tired. But I think I have more capacity without the, you know. 60 plus hours of stress during a week work week yeah that now i have so much more flexibility i don't know what's different about that stress because you're now you've got like the unknown stress of right. i'm gonna be jobless if i right. don't do something i work for right? myself and either money comes or it doesn't <laughs> yeah. yeah no stress there no but... none <laughs> how's that different because you do seem a lot happier and lighter i think that some of the pieces of principling were were just challenging fit for my personality. Hmm. It felt like whenever I was interacting with people, it was because there was a problem. And through no fault of anyone, like that's just the nature of being the principal. And you feel like that person's so busy that I'm not going to bother them with my story of the cherry pie I made this last weekend because they're so busy. I'm only going to go to them if I really need something. Yeah. Right? And so for... From my vantage point, that created kid problem, teacher problem, parent problem, office problem, kid problem, teacher problem. Just that was my day. Wow. And then it's 5 o'clock, but you have a 7.30 PTSA meeting, so I might as well just keep working on the stuff that I didn't get to during the day until 7.30 because I'm here and <laughs> it's finally quiet and then get home at... 9 30 if I'm lucky and go to sleep and do it again so it was just I think the I don't know energy capacity like the level yeah. of how much you can do in that vein of like I'm solving I'm helping I'm you know yeah it sounds like you're really fixing tapping. and then and I'm, then what's also it? like time Oh. how much time you're doing that right a 12-hour day yeah and then come back and do it again tomorrow at 
And there was a significant commute. Right. So you're spending Right. So I'd leave, I'd try to be out of the house by at least seven and I'd be there. It would take me an hour. Yeah. I'd get there by eight. Have you ever experienced a surprise reserve of physical energy after removing an emotional stress or strain? Jen's experience of ridiculous work demands as school principal is not uncommon, unfortunately. I hear many accounts of people who spend more than the eight-hour day dedicated to managing work or worrying about work. We often don't realize how much our stress and worry can drain us until it's gone. It can affect all areas of health in really sneaky ways. I couldn't have predicted that Jen would feel greater cardiovascular capacity just from quitting her job. That was really great to learn. Too often, we don't notice how much we're pushing ourselves until something gets our attention. And for some people, it's pain that does that. Pain certainly forces us to stop and take inventory and hopefully find new ways forward. It doesn't have to be as drastic as a career change, but it's important to take note that something needs to change. Even if you make the choice to use over-the-counter pain medications to turn off the pain, remember to check back with yourself about what it is that needs your attention. And if you can't figure it out on your own, find somebody who can help by giving you an outside perspective. It also sounds like you're getting better quality sleep or or more sleep or something. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I have been able to play with, since I don't have a hard start and stop, Mm -hmm. with, okay, where would I naturally fall? Isn't that right? Like, what time am I tired? Yeah. And what time do I just, bing, okay, I'm ready to get up. And so starting the day that way rather than e e e is really nice. Yeah. And interesting because I don't I have kind of a window it seems like. I don't necessarily I wake up with Phil when he goes when he does his thing and gets out the door which is usually like 6, but it's like a wake up knowing I can go back to sleep. Hmm. So humane. Yes. <laughs> and sometimes I get up at like 6.30 because I just start thinking about stuff or they're, you know. Yeah. Or I'm like, wow, that bagel sounds really good. <laughs> get up and toast it. <laughs> and so there might be some days where I do just get up or I think, oh, if I get up now, I'm going to have so much time to do whatever I want until there's something that I really yeah. am committed to do. But sometimes I'll let myself fall back asleep and then it'll be 8 o'clock and I'm like, oh, I'm ready to get up. I think for many people, this probably seems like a crazy fantasy notion. The idea of getting up when you feel awake and ready and going to bed when your body feels tired. But getting to know your biorhythms can be eye-opening and freeing, even if you don't have the luxury to act on the information in the most ideal way. You can at least make better choices about things like when to work out rather than doing things that require focus or when to eat or what time to try to go to bed. And if you still don't have any choice about any of these things, you can at least exercise some compassion for yourself when you realize life's demands are simply out of sync with what your natural energy fluctuations are. While the thought of not having to wake up to an alarm is extremely enticing for most of us, for people with depression, it can be really important to have obligations like work, family, and even a pet that needs feeding or walking first thing in the morning. Without reasons like this to get up, someone whose system is neurobiochemically compromised simply won't, and that can lead to a downward spiral of self-perpetuating depression and fatigue. Have you played with the notion of biorhythms? Does the freedom to get up when you want appeal to you, or are you someone who likes to have a reason to force you to get out of bed? Maybe it's the other end of the day, needing something like a good book to entice you to start the sleep ritual? Is there anything else you want to add, Some a nugget that stands out for you about where you're at now? I guess it's been an interesting journey in exploring kind of that stress connection with how your body responds. And I feel like it's been great to have you involved as an outside lens, asking questions and probing so that you're sort of making me think about those pieces and then I can make insights on my own out in the world. What are your thoughts about the effect of stress on your body? Have you ever had the chance to experience the connection yourself? It's something that affects all of us at some point. The important thing is to take notice. And then the question is, what do we do about it? What are we able to do about it? Jen has transitioned from a work stress that was wildly outside of her control 
to a more creative stress, a stress that has payoff and is much more self-directed. So instead of stressing out about how to manage all the chaos being thrown in her direction, she's now only stressing about this amazing new venture that she is creating for herself and calling the shots on. Whatever change we make in response to pain or stress, it has to match our unique needs. Not everyone would thrive in the situation that Jen has created for herself. And maybe she will show up in a future episode for a follow-up on how things actually end up panning out and if she manages to stay in control of her various aches and pains. That wraps up the very first episode of Conversations About Everyday Pain. Please join me for another episode next week with more explorations of why it hurts, how to make it stop, and keep it from happening again. If you have thoughts about this episode or want to share your own experiences with pain, please join and help me grow the Everyday Pain Forum on Facebook groups. If groups are not your thing, you can just like and follow the Everyday Pain Guide Facebook page or check out tweets by at NoEverydayPain. Our theme music is by Eric and Magill. Occasionally, guests' names are altered to protect their privacy. Thanks for listening, and until next time, I hope you also find a way to talk about your pain. Oh.